Good afternoon. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. We're going to present about the newborn skin care. My friend Khuloud and myself, Salma, uh, we have experienced neonatal ICU. Neonatal skin care, it's an important topic, uh, very important for the healthcare team who's working in the NICU and also for the normal newborn nursery. And especially it is of importance for the neonatal nurses because they are dealing and handling uh, daily bedside care with the hospitalized neonates. So um, the major uh, objective or the major goal to maintain the skin integrity of the newborn is to have an intact skin free of injury, free of harm. And it's very important for the nurses to know the difference between the premature skin uh, integrity versus the skin of the preterm and versus the pediatric or the adult skin. So we're going to tackle through the presentation what's the updates, evidence-based updates regarding certain uh, practices uh, related to uh, the nurses that they do at the bedside, for example, bathing, uh, for example, regarding uh, the care of the court care, and regarding the antiseptic application of which the um, eff efficient antiseptic solution to be applied. But before that, let me introduce you to the latest evidence-based uh, skin care guideline, uh, which was presented, uh, published from uh, the two nursing organizations, the, the Associations of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, and the National Association of Neonatal uh, Nurses. They have uh, published the fourth edition, 2018, about the neonatal care, skin uh, uh, care, uh, evidence-based clinical practice guideline, where it tackled the latest uh, research and evidence in the neonatal skin care, which um, have um, uh, one goal, which is to change of the practice uh, that is important for the improvement of the neonatal skin condition, and also to increase the knowledge of the nurses at the bedside who's caring for hospitalized uh, neonates. Very important to go through the anatomy and physiology of the skin function of the newborn. Um, the skin, which is the last organ of the body, it assists in the thermoregulation. It has a barrier function, so it will prevent from uh, the invasion of microorganisms. It will prevent from uh, infection. It will prevent the absorption of toxins uh, from the application of topical products. And also, it acts as a fat storage, uh, very important for tactile st sensation, especially after the delivery, skin-to-skin -skin contact. A very important function of the skin that it prevents evaporative heat loss and will prevent from insensible water loss, and this is when the skin is mature enough. The stratum corneum, which is the top layer of the skin, it plays an important role as a skin barrier function. And this stratum corneum will reach term maturity at 34 weeks of gestation. So before that, at 23 weeks of gestation, this stratum corneum is non-existent even. So there is no barrier function for the skin. So it will reach the full term thickness at 40 weeks of gestational age. The infants who are born before 34 weeks of gestation, it takes about four to five weeks for the skin to mature. The stratum corneum, as I've said, it's not well developed until the 32 to 34 weeks of gestation, meaning to say all the infants who are below 32 weeks of gestation, that are very fragile skin, uh, very permeable uh, for a skin injury. So the underdeveloped stratum corneum, it makes the preterm infant more at risk for increase in the insensible water loss. Uh, risk and skin injuries. And more prone for skin injury. Let me take you first with the evidence for the vernix. The vernix, it is the, uh, when the baby is born, it has this layer, the cheesy-like layer. The importance of this vernix, the constituent of that vernix, it includes 80% water, 10% protein, and 10% lipids. So the protection, it acts as an antibacterial, um, it, so it uh, prevents from infection, and it acts as a waterproof, and usually it's a natural moisturizer. It acts as a hydration for the skin. And plus, it plays a very important role with the acid mantle formation, uh, the pH development of the skin. The skin, it's acidic in nature. It's between 4.5 to 5.5 which will enhance the normal micro, uh, 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 the flora development on the skin. WHO recommendation for neonatal skin care, they recommend that to leave that vernix intact, um, uh, not to be removed before the bathing by six hours, so to get the utmost benefit. Bathing is an important um, <clears throat> 
practice, which is performed by the neonatal nurses. And there are different kinds of bathing. You have the sponge bathing, the emergent tap bathing, and the swaddling, uh, swaddling bathing. So um, uh, what is important, there are a controversial issue globally about when the first bath should occur after the delivery. Usually, it's supposed to be when the infant will reach cardiovascular stability and temperature stability. And this, it is required to take two readings of temperature to be more than more or equal to 36.8. For full-term infant, it should be between 6 to 24 hours of age, the first bathing. So if we said that the vernix should stay six hours, meaning to say the first bathing should occur at six hours, six hours up to 24 hours, or as soon as it has to be as soon as possible if uh, the infant or the mother of HIV um, uh, mothers because of from the risk of um, uh, infection, in, exactly transition, transmission. transmission of infection. While for the late preterm infants, from with 34 to 36 week of gestational age, ideally uh, we should wait 12 to 24 hours of age before starting the initial bath. Okay. So routine bathing, uh, daily washing with liquid baby cleansers, uh, delay uh, natural skin barrier maturation. So if you're li washing the baby every day or giving a bath, it's going to delay in the skin barrier, and the, the maturation of the skin barrier, as we mentioned, that it takes time for it to develop. Before we reach to the 32 weeker, mm. so if we said we cannot, you know, it's um, recommended not to wash, uh, to give a bath on a daily basis. So latest evidence base, they recommend that every four days, uh, that's the appropriate um, time for the interval of bathing. So it should not occur on a daily basis, yes. but on uh, every four days. Okay, so less than 32 weekers, uh, we should use only warm water uh, the first week of life uh, the risk for, in, uh, for skin irritation uh, from kinsid. So you we already mentioned that the preterms have a very fragile skin. So using just water to so make sure that because of these, these babies can absorb anything at this very uh, uh, early uh, gestational age. So only warm water during the first week of life. All right, so the, the lower the gestational age, the lower the stratum corneum. stratum corneum, which increases more risk of exposure to irritation and skin injuries. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, regarding the mild, so it's recommended either to use a mild cleanser which has a neutral or mildly acidic, uh, uh, which mimics the skin pH, which is between 5.5 to 7. And also, it's recommended to avoid any antimicrobial soaps, uh, such as uh, what's Detol the name? And, Detol and uh, Life Boy, which contains a yeah, high uh, antibacterial uh, solution, which can cause the effect to the normal floor of the baby. And it uh, causes harshness uh, or negative effect on the normal skin colonization. Yes. yes. The umbilical cord care, um, it will take 5 to 15 days for the cord to dry. Um, you need to follow a clean technique to avoid contamination. The recommendation it is to keep dry cord care, avoid applying any antimicrobial antiseptics. Mm -hmm. This is also for the risk of absorption um, of this topical Toxic agents. Yes. Uh, the, the antimicrobial agents such as povidone should be avoided, povidone iodine, chlorhexidine, triple antibiotic ointment, alcohol triple dye. All of these should be avoided. So the recommendation only dry cord care. And this is, as I've said, because of the risk of the absorption and toxicity, which can reduce the normal flora and um, enhance uh, the microorganism colonization at the umbilical stem. Uh, diaper dermatitis, infants in the normal newborn nursery or in the NICU, they have the uh, more prevalent to acquire diaper dermatitis. The progress is at the first weeks after birth and high incidence at the first month up to 25%. Uh, who are at risk for acquiring diaper dermatitis? I'm sure it's uh, a problem that every neonatal nurse uh, encounters encounter. during her shift. Yes. Exactly. So frequent loose stool and diarrhea, antibiotic use, uh, opioid withdrawal, ab abnormal sphincter tone and allergies to food can actually cause this kind of uh, der dermatitis, diaper dermatitis. 
It will lead the uh, diaper dermatitis, the um, risk factors, mainly it is from the combination of urine and stool. What will happen? It will increase the skin pH. Remember, the skin pH is supposed to be acidic, low. So the combination of urine and feces, it will lead to increase in the skin pH. This will activate the microbiota, activate fecal enzymes, and will impair the skin integrity of the uh, diaper perineal area. In addition to ap application of the chemical irritants like the harsh soap or detergent, mm -hmm. all also, uh, other risk factors, the friction, the way how you clean with the moisture, meaning to say not changing the diaper frequently, so the moisture also will affect the skin integrity, plus the newborn susceptibility, whatever uh, uh, Khulud uh, did mention earlier, it will low, all lead to impaired in the skin barrier and will lead to the problem of diaper right. dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Symptoms, it's starting with erythema, redness. That's the first symptoms where you can identify, yes, there is a diaper dermatitis and mild scaling. It can progress to even the worst condition of excoriation or ulcerated lesions. So as a neonatal nurse, you need to avoid that. You need to avoid that. So before even starting having the redness symptoms, you, see, you need to start with your precautionary measures, which we're gonna cover in the next slide. So the treatment, uh, based on uh, assessment and severity of the skin breakdown. So if you notice that they're starting to have redness, so make sure you're continuously checking and continuously frequently cleaning the baby gently and then using a, uh, uh, doing your assessment, uh, uh, frequent in using a skin barrier as well. So contact irritant uh, irrit dermatitis. dermatitis, thick coating barrier. So if you're applying the zinc oxide, don't just be very stingy, as we say. Be generous. Apply as much as you can because you need to create this barrier in order to preserve the skin in, uh, integrity. And there's also using a petroleum, petroleum jelly over the barrier to help. But as I said, try to prevent it by frequent assessment and frequent care. Because if you apply the diaper directly to the uh, barrier, to the zinc oxide, what will happen? The barrier will absorb the zinc oxide, and then the baby will not get the benefit of the barrier. So that's why it's advisable. When you apply the zinc oxide thoroughly on the skin, like so, in the yeah. picture here, they stated like like a frosting on a cake, then you apply a little bit of, zinc, of uh, Vaseline or petroleum jelly over the diaper, so that it will create over the diaper, yes. yes so that the diaper will not absorb the zinc oxide. Yes. Yes. Okay. So interventions, uh, super absorbent dis uh, dis uh, disposable uh, diapers are recommended to use. Uh, frequent diaper changing, again, I'm going to stress on this. I know our shift becomes busy sometimes, we're handling more than one baby, but please, it's very important to frequently do your, uh, your care and changing the diaper frequently. Uh, gentle cleanser without removal of barrier, air dry, meaning that you already applied your uh, zinc oxide and you applied your petroleum jelly. So once you notice that the baby, uh, say for instance, past stool or urine and you want to clean it, just clean it gently enough just to clean. Don't uh, harshly try to remove whatever you've applied so you can apply a fresh coat, okay? Uh, Painting uh, technique instead of, patting technique instead of a vigorous rubbing, as I mentioned, and encourage breastfeeding. Because the human milk is <coughs> superseding the formula. The formula is one of the causative factors for diaper rash. So the human milk, it has a less, a less uh, causative, um, um, actually it will help with the maturity of the skin. Okay. So prevention is the golden standard and also consistency in care. Now, what's the updates regarding the disposable diaper wipes? You know, some commercial diaper wipes, some hospitals, they might have wipes. Maybe the parents, they will, be, they will ask you, you know, is it recommended if I will clean with the diaper wipes? It's recommended, but it needs to be containing only essential ingredients, no alcohol, no perfumes, and free from preservatives. So if it meets all th these ingredients, meaning to say it's safe to use the diaper wipes. Otherwise, if it's having um, uh, preservatives, this will contribute more to the skin irritation and increase the risk for allergic contact uh, dermatitis. What you should avoid with the diaper dermatitis, the topical corticosteroids, because it has a risk for cushion syndrome, systemic toxicity, and dermal atrophy. Antibiotics ointments also needs to be avoided. The use of antibiotics, yes. you should be aware of this. Exactly, talcum baby powder because of the risk of the inhaled powders, and the cornstarch. All of these should be avoided, and especially when you give teaching to the parents, you should stress on these points. 
skin assessment. Uh, so many tools exist, a uh, few with validity and reliability. But Ms. Yes, Vita, Ms. Vita will uh, talk to you guys about uh, the skin assessment and uh, what you should do with that. Identify and treat uh, diaper dermatitis based on type and degree of the skin breakdown. As we mentioned, it could, you can see uh, erythema, so you can apply zinc oxide, apply petroleum jelly after that to make sure that it doesn't wipe off, and then gentle cleansing with, a, with the diaper changing without the removal of the barrier, okay? All right. Okay, if a very important uh, topic to discuss is about the application of the skin disinfectants. Um, it's applied prior to any invasive uh, procedures due to the uh, high risk of hospital acquired infection, especially in the neonatal population. And usually any invasive procedures such as the venipuncture, the heel pricks, uh, before the umbilical line insertions, chest tubes, uh, CVC, central line insertion. However, the selection of uh, disinfectants there is insufficient evidence in the neonatal population to recommend a single product uh, to be used for all procedures for the neonates in the NICU. Why? Because of uh, irritability, toxicity, and skin irritation. Uh, each of the products, they have uh, these factors uh, affecting on the skin of the newborn. Uh, what are the availability of the, in the market for the skin uh, uh, disinfectants? You have the aqueous or the mixed with the 70% isopropyl alcohol from 0.5 to 4% chlorhexidine, 10% providone iodine, and 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, recommendation for the chlorhexidine, it is recommended as best practice in adults and pediatrics. A few studies in the neonatal population confirm the superiority of and efficacy of the chlorhexidine preparation over other disinfectants such as the povidone iodine in the prevention of infection. But what is the risk? Usually, as we've said, because we've talked about the, uh, the uh, skin structure of the premature infants, yeah. especially below the 32 weeks of gestation, yes. Uh, so with disinfectants, first two weeks of life is at risk. So why we're saying this is because, uh, you know, we mentioned that this, the, the premature skin is very fragile. So they're very susceptible to skin irritation, chemical burns, and uh, contact dermatitis because of that. So you're trying to make sure you're disinfecting because you want to prevent infection, but then you're going to have to do some precautions after that to make sure uh, to avoid any of these injuries. Risk, yes. Okay? So this is the chemical burns that uh, occurs because of not doing the preventative measures after using a um, disinfectant. disinfectant. So this is an example of uh, chemical burns. From povidone iodine. From povidone iodine and uh, alcohol. as alcohol. And then this is also another picture of um, uh, chemical burns using a uh, chlorhexidine with uh, alcohol. And remember that, uh, as uh, Khaloud uh, said, the, the more uh, uh, susceptible uh, premature infants usually below 32 weeks, and especially yes. in 26 weeker of gestational age, then the less than one kilogram, they are more susceptible for uh, skin erosion skin, yes. from uh, burns. Yes. So the recommendation for safe application is to allow air dry prior to central venous catheter insertion. Av uh, avoid pooling on the pouring. Well, actually. Like if you're going to use a chlorhexidine or any of the solutions, don't pour so much into it where just, enough. just pat enough for you to um, uh, cleanse the area. Remove completely with sterile water or saline. And do not use alcohol to remove. Yes, and oftentimes okay. this is being missed by the neonatal nurse after the procedure. You know, you will see uh, a 26 weeker uh, umbilical line being inserted, and then after a while you will see a reaction on this uh, complete redness. And Which you will fall through the back as well. Redness and burn, severe uh, uh, skin integrity, um, skin injury. And this is being missed by the neonatal nurses. It needs really to be after the procedure of central line insertion or umbilical line insertion, please, whatever residual on the skin, it needs to be washed completely either with the sterile water or with saline yes please do not use an alcohol yes. base just sterile water and saline gently remove whatever uh, chemicals that's in there before it will lead to a burn medical adhesives or marcy 
the MARC, which is uh, medical adhesive related skin injuries. This is in, um, uh, the most iatrogenic um, skin injuries that occur in the NICU. And this is due to the fact for application of medical adhesives uh, that are used to secure the lines, the tubes, the cables, or for uh, monitoring equipment. What happened and or why it happened? Remember the premature neonates, they have uh, a poor barrier skin and they have the connection between the epidermal and the dermal uh, skin layers the cohesion is very minimal. So what happens when you apply the medical adhesive and then you remove it, the first layer of the skin is being detached, it's being removed. So um, uh, the most um, important or the most um, uh, the most uh, injury from the medical adhesive, it's the mecha mechanical injuries and usually are named uh, after the epidermal stripping. From the epidermal stripping, we have the skin tears and you have the contact dermatitis. The contact dermatitis, it's usually because of the chemical irritation from certain medical adhesives, especially like, for example, electrolytes, uh, electrodes, or from certain dressing. Uh, this is certain types, uh, some uh, pictures showing you the types of uh, injuries related to Marcy. Uh, you can see in one of the pictures, this is the contact, uh, uh, this one, the first one, it's a contact dermatitis after the alcohol or electrodes, uh, uh, ECG electrodes application. The other one, the baby intubated after retaping of the ET tube, you could see that, that there was an, uh, an injury. And the other one on the foot, it's because of uh, the application and the improper removal of the medical adhesives. And these things are very common pictures actually that we see every day during our, uh, our nursing. It's very common in the NICU where we're changing the, the ETT dressing and then you can easily you just remove it very harshly and you will have these injury easily. It can happen to anyone without intention. This is why we're trying to aware you guys that should be gentle. gentle. Uh, yes. So uh, to choose the medical adhesives, uh, prevention is the golden standard, definitely. So you have to choose the adhesive which can cause the less trauma to the skin. And especially with the, uh, with the adhesives, use the adhesives such as silicon tape or hydrogel tape uh, for the tubes. They are the non-critical tubes, meaning to say that it will require frequent uh, change of position, especially for the temperature probe or for the saturation probe. Um, hydrocolloid dressing can be used as a platform under the adhesive, especially for the out uh, uh, ostomy pouches and also can be used as a tape under the uh, certain medical adhesives because it will uh, absorb the moisture and it will mold uh, um, better for the skin. To remove the adhesive, there is a technique. So you need to remove it in a careful, like Khulud said, it yeah, should not gentle. be, it should not be harsh, it should not be quickly, it should be in a gentle, careful way, and remember, because of the premature infants, they are highly susceptible for absorption of toxins, so avoid the use of um, uh, adhesive removal. So it's better to use the moistened gauze uh, with, the, uh, water. with water while you're science. trying to remove the adhesive to avoid the injury. Uh, so premature infants are more susceptible to uh, trans epidermal water loss. So premature infants less than 30 weekers or uh, weighing um, less than a kilo and 200 grams are at risk for insensible water loss. So premature skin, uh, so yeah, so if you're losing water loss, you're going to also increase the evaporation of heat loss which then will lead to hypothermia. So mature skin barrier function is not activated until 30 to 32 weeker, as we mentioned earlier. Okay, so interventions to prevent hypothermia and preventing the insensible water loss and the evaporation of the heat, as we mentioned doing our uh, resuscitation program. So at less than 32 weekers, we should always use a uh, plastic polythenium bag to wrap the infant, do not dry, just place them inside the bag and then make sure it's up to the neck with the umbilical exposed and it's perf and covered completely. Do not dry again. So increasing the delivery room temperature from 20, uh, 23 to 25 degrees when you know that it's a preterm delivery, place in a humidified incubator setting with 70% for the first uh, seven days of life then gradually decreasing it to 50% until uh, the infant is about 28 days old or up to 32 weeks of gestational age. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Okay. So more at risk, at less than 26 weeks, due to immature skin structure, as we mentioned, lack of uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue, and then the small bl uh, blood vessels. Okay. So to prevent extravasation, how did risk sir? Yes. Select. Okay. Um, try to select the more distal veins. Uh, more larger veins, avoid placing uh, in areas that's difficult to mobilize, uh, regularly review the line necessity. So sometimes the, the patient is still go, has a, a peripheral IV line, but he's not on IV antibiotic, he's no more on uh, IV fluid, the patient is full fluid, so why do we still have this on? So this is creating a risk. Yes, uh, for infection as well. So for ongoing visualization, secure access adhesive with transparent dressing. We've been stressing, uh, stressing actually about this. So use always transparent dressing so you can visualize the line the and you can pick up early sign during assessment if it's starting to be red, swelling, uh, the uh, cold. Um, and we're gonna talk about this actually in yes. the next slide, yes. Okay, so and then avoid also, uh, your, I know you're so, so happy that you find a line and you want to secure it, so avoid securing it very tightly and um, doing multiple uh, tapes so, so you can make sure the line is not being loose. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So prevention to reduce the risk of uh, extravasation. Uh, the solutions running in the PIV uh, should be ideal or physio fitting the physiologic osmolality. Maximum concentration, as you know, for the dextrose should be running up to 12.5, not more than that. Any more than 12.5, it should be, you have to secure, or ask for to secure a central line. Um, hourly assessment is mandated, hourly assessment, not every three hours or every four hours or every shift. In order to have a prevention, uh, earlier infiltration, so you have to do hourly assessment. And do not rely only on the infusion pump. Yeah, you know all of us, we're having smart pump, so it's very important to visualize the site and to detect infiltration earlier. Don't rely on, on, until the pump when, uh, when alarm, it will alarm. Signs of extravasations, swelling, signs of pain or discomfort, blanching, inability to flush line, leakage at insertion site, all of these are signs. Don't wait, oh, I'm still observing it. Once you have a doubt, remove it immediately, change it. Okay, and blistering or skin sloughing because you don't want to reach to that stage. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna leave a scar. Interventions, you have to stop immediately the infusions, elevate the site, and administer hyaluronic days, not more than 12 hours, and this is, it should be uh, administered around the site. Uh, interventions uh, to avoid um, what needs to be avoided during the intravenous extravasation when you have topical application of uh, silver uh, silver diazin and topical application of heat or cold this is because uh, you want to prevent the risk of thermal injury so these are interventions that we should avoid no longer in practice okay uh, very important skin injury that every single uh, neonate is at risk in the NICU is the medical device related pressure injuries. Meaning to say all the newborns in the NICU, they are, they're having medical devices uh, required for their management and monitoring. And you can see all of these devices from the ventilatory to the monitoring, saturation, temperature probe, central lines, even the orogastric, nasogastric tube, the EEG leads, uh, even the blood pressure cuffs and the IV tubings and arm boards. To of prevention is the golden standard uh, for any pressure injuries. And the um, National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel in 2017, they have released the best practice for prevention of medical device related pressure injury. So if you follow all of these interventions, that would be the appropriate, um, uh, the appropriate uh, measurement as a neonatal uh, uh, ICU nurse uh, for prevention of skin injury. First of all, you need to uh, choose the correct size of the medical device. If you are applying nasal up, it has to be the right prong size for the premature infant. Protect the skin with the dressings in high risk areas, for example, the nasal bridge, the adhesive barrier, it's recommended to use a, a hydrocolloid dressing under the interface or under the device, the CPAP device. The skin in contact with device, it needs to be assessed at least daily, if not medically contraindicated. You have to remove the device and assess. A frequent assessment is the best standard. And uh, the devices should be placed uh, 
um, uh, should not be placed over existing pressure injuries. And um, very important to educate the staff on the correct use of devices and prevention of skin breakdown. Um, do not let the infant lie on any device. Otherwise, you know, with the skin assessment, when you position the infant, just make sure that there is no devices uh, that the baby. Look at the second picture where the baby is lying on a, on a tubing. This will cause a pressure on the soft tissue and will lead to uh, uh, a pressure injury because of the medical device. The first picture, it is about a saturation probe, which was not assessed properly. That's why all the devices needs to be removed and you have to assess thoroughly the skin surfaces under the devices. Look at the third picture. This is because of the ECG leads. It's starting with erythema. Erythema, it's the first skin impairment uh, leading to skin injury. So once you see a redness, you have to start your uh, precautionary measures. And the fourth picture, it's about the ID band. The fifth picture, you could see that the baby was lying on the IV tubing. That's why it left an erythema mark. Uh, we can go quickly. We have a practical session about showing you the uh, a real pressure injury so that you will be able to identify which staging uh, 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 it will relate to. But you know, it's very important that you consult uh, on your unit with an ostomy or a wound care nurse, which she will help with to evaluate and to assess regarding the staging of wound or any hospital acquired pressure injuries. But we, quickly, yeah. we can go so through. So in stage one, you notice that the skin is intact but non blenching erythema. Uh, in stage two, there's partial thickness loss with exposed dermis, uh, maybe an intact or ruptured blister. Stage three, full thickness loss with exposed of the uh, adipose tissue. So now you can actually go down and see the adipose tissue and may include undermining or tunneling. So it will look like a deep, uh, wound. deep wound. And then stage four is full thickness skin and tissue loss with bone, tendons, or muscle exposure, often with undermining or tunneling. So this is now reaching to a severe stage, right? So, and then we have a deep tissue pressure injury where you can see a discoloration, so intact or non-intact skin with evidence of underlining tissue damage, such, such as non-blenchable, non deep red, purple, or maroon uh, discoloration may uh, be a blood flow uh, blister. And then we have an unstageable, so it's full thickness tissue loss, depth of the injury uh, obscured by sloth, or so we cannot see how deep this injury is because there's just like a, a scab right on top of that. Okay, so this is a mucosal uh, injury, so it's pressure injury to the mucosal tissue resulting from a medical device, naturally it's a nasal CPAP, prongs or ETT, uh, which you will notice it on the lip, and uh, you cannot stage this one. Uh, just okay. I want to, uh, before 2016, they used to be called pressure ulcers. Yes. So the latest evidence now, uh, they have changed it to pressure injuries, yes. and they've added the, the medical device related to pressure injuries. Uh, mucosal pressure injuries was added. Um, because, as she said, it cannot be staged, uh, uh, especially uh, it had identified the, the nasal injuries under the nasal CPAP. We will show you some practical uh, pictures uh, after the session of Ms. Vita. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Kulud and Ms. Salma. I will just continue with my presentation. My presentation is on neonatal skin assessment, evaluation, and documentation. So I'm going to talk about, I think, mostly the neonatal skin care guideline is already uh, covered by the previous lecture. So I'm just going to talk about only the neonatal skin condition scale and the assessment scale, neonatal skin risk assessment scale. So as we know in the NICU, the main nursing role is a part of nursing process. We have to recognize the need for a clinical tool to help to standardize skin assessment and to increase the awareness of skin injury in the NICU environment. So the goal to assess the, to assess the patient, to improve patient outcome by taking a proactive approach in skin care and wound prevention and to intervene early if necessary with skin and wound management. So the main goal is to prevent the skin injury. So that's what we do the assessment. 
So I'm, go I'm not going to talk about the skin structure and layers of the skin. And it was already well covered with the previous uh, lecture. So I'll just move uh, very quickly to the assessment. So before we go to the assessment, all the NICU nurses must know the structure and layers of the skin and also the functions of the skin. So if they, do, if they don't know about the skin function and layers, and it, is, it will be very difficult for them to do the skin assessment. So as we all know, we have a three layers for the epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous layer. And we have seen the anatomical difference between the term and preterm, uh, which we need to concentrate. And if you want to really evaluate or to deliver appropriate care, we need to know about the characteristics of, of the skin also. So I will just touch on the three points. What are the characteristics of the newborn skin? The first one on the skin appearance. The second thing, skin pH, which was covered, and nutritional store. This is also very important. Uh, skin appearance, as we know from the term and preterm, uh, the term infants are very soft and it was very co well covered with vernix. But if you look at this preterm babies, more transparent, and uh, you can see subcutaneous edema may be present. And skin pH, it is very important to assess, and, uh, especially with the skin, acid mental. So what is the, why we need to have the acid mental? Because the acid mental is the characteristic mechanism can defense against the infection. So if you see, compare uh, with the term and preterm, full-term infants, they have skin pH at birth, 6.37. And during the next four hours, it falls to 4.9. And it creates acid mental to prevent the infection. But compare with the preterm infant, the skin pH is greater than 6 and declines to 5.5 over first week and five to first first month. So still, um, you can find the difference between the term and preterm, and preterms are more prone for infection. And nutritional store, fat, trace, mineral, zinc accumulate in the fetus during third trimester, which we lack in the preterm infant. And uh, so this accumulation is necessary to prevent nutritional deficiencies that cause skin injury. OK, let's go move to the skin assessment. Uh, routine assessment is mandatory uh, for a good skin care to maintain, to prevent the infection, to prevent the skin injury. Uh, as we can see, the skin assessment, routine assessment, should be come done every 12 hours or every shift. If, you are, if it is only 8 hours, it needs to be done every 8 hours. Now the question is, which tool we will use? So based on the evidence base, we have a uh, couple of tools, Braden Q, Braden, Glomergan, uh, neonatal skin conditional scale, and neonatal skin condition risk assessment. I'm just going to highlight two things, which is now recently um, uh, from the evidence-based study. So the first one is the neonatal skin condition scale. Avon and Nan, they have done this research. And uh, as we have seen in the previous uh, lecture, Ms. Um, uh, Fatma and Kulu, they have discussed about the um, skin uh, skincare guidelines. So in that uh, article, we can see that pre, before they implemented the guideline, they have done, they have collected the data. And after they implemented the guideline, they have collected the da data. So this scale is used after implemented the guidelines. So it shows really improvement in the term infant compared with the preterm. So here you can see three things are evaluated. The first one is dryness, erythema, and breakdown. So neonatal skin condition scale just to evaluate the overall skin condition. So you cannot evaluate the risk, but you can just reevaluate the overall skin condition scale. The second scale is the neonatal skin risk assessment scale in 2018 based on the research. They mentioned that this scale is really preferable can be used in neonatal ICU because they have involved the studies with the preterm infant, and it showed a, a good outcome to identify the risk. Uh, so the, uh, just to compare both neonatal skin condition scale and neonatal skin risk assessment scale, only one word is different is risk in between two scale. The first one, 
as i mentioned to you evaluate overall skin condition not as a risk assessment and the study which includes 2820 new units including extreme low birth weight and validity and reliability demonstrated but new unit skin risk assessment scale uh, as we can see here we have six parameters and high reliability for the subscales of general position condition activity and nutrition so the first three parameters and low reliability in mental state mobility and moisture so this is useful to prevent to identify the risk for skin breakdown or skin injury so let's discuss first regarding the neonatal skin condition scale so it is an objective scale uh, you will just look at the patient for the three things to evaluate first one is dryness erythema and breakdown so the perfect score is three one two three we can see that if it is more than that it means there is skin breakdown so first one dryness if, the, if you score one it has to be normal score two dry skin or visible scaling score three very dry skin or crack cracking already second uh, parameter is erythema number one no evidence of erythema number two visible erythema less than 50 percentage of body surface and score three visible erythema more than 50 percentage of body surface the third parameter is bra break skin breakdown Num uh, score one is nothing score two small localized areas and three extensive we can see some of the samples mm, if you look at this baby okay so uh, okay so just tell me is there any dryness you can see i think it's very clear dryness yes dryness is evident okay so how how you can score two or three it can be two okay what about erythema is there any erythema yeah breakdown no skin breakdown okay so it's mainly the dryness as you can see okay there is dry skin and you can see the visible scaling no evidence of erythema okay and no evidence so the, here the score is four okay so the it the difference here is it can evaluate only the skin condition so you cannot identify the risk to prevent the skin breakdown okay let us do so the total score is five four okay let's do this one this is a preterm baby, 28 weeks. Okay, dryness. Is there any dryness? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Erythema? Yes. So you can give score two or three. Extensive? Or more than 50 percentage or less than 50 percentage? Less than. Okay, breakdown? Yes. Yes. Actually, there is, here you can see it the dryness there is no visible dryness but the prob here you can see there is erythema less than 50 percentage you can see if you calculate the whole percentage it's not more than 50 percentage it's less than 50 percentage and you can see the skin breakdown because of the plasters okay so most common injury in the nic is mostly related to the plaster and medical device and the evidence base says it's around 50 percentage more than that it is medical device related injury so this is due to plaster so the score is five. So the guidelines, 2018, now it's newly published, already discussed. So why I'm saying this? Because they use this in A1 and none. They have done a research uh, based on the guideline. They, uh, they implemented the guideline, then they evaluated with the NSCS, and they found good outcome. Okay. So the main practice, as they discuss, to use the neonatal skin care guidelines to promote normal skin development, reduce the pressure injury, prevent dryness, avoid exposure of toxins, and minimize the exposure to unnecessary substances. So this is what I was talking about, neonatal skin care. This is one of the evidence base, which is published on February 2018. Uh, clinical outcomes, outcomes of A1 evidence based clinical practice guidelines after they have, implement, they have implemented this guideline in, in NICU and the step down areas plus well baby newborns. So as you can see here, they mentioned that uh, after they have implemented the guidelines, 
and they have started to evaluate based on the neonatal skin condition scale in 51 hospitals and they demonstrated by changed care practices and improved skin condition in premature and full term newborns and also you can see three 56 well baby newborns and 2000 464 NICU babies were assessed during the study and after implementation of the guidelines skin condition was improved as reflected by less visible dryness, redness and skin breakdown including NICU, step down areas and newborn, well baby nursery. So mostly in some hospitals they are using both scale. The first one is NSCS. They are just routinely doing the assessment, and for risk they use Glomergan or neonatal skin con skin risk assessment scale. Anyway, let's discuss about the second scale. This is um, this is to assess the risk for skin breakdown. They call NSRS or neonatal skin risk assessment scale. So here you can see there are six uh, parameters. First one, general physical um, condition that is based on the gestation, gestational age, mental state, mobility, activity, nutrition, and you can see the muscle. <coughs> so here you can see it was developed uh, um, especially for the newborn, newborn population. The NSRA, neonatal skin risk assessment is used only in the neonatal population, but where, whereas Braden Q, Braden, Glomergan, as you can see, they are using in the pediatric plus adult. So, which was mentioned already, there are six parameters to assess specifically for the neonates, including the preterm and extreme low birth weight. And uh, if you see the uh, scale, the overall, uh, the score, if you calculate, if it is less than 13, it is indicated as high risk. 13 to 17, moderate. Okay, more than that, it's low risk. You can see the baby very clearly. Okay, so the general physician condition, you can see here, it's 29 weeks of gestation. In the practical session, we can do some worksheet regarding the how to score the baby with the scenario. So here you can see gestational age more than 28 weeks, but less than 33. This is the criteria, so num this is score two. And you can see the mental state two, mobility two, activity two, nutrition. It's supplemented with TPN, so two moisture. The skin condition is constant and moist. So the overall score is? 11. So this baby is high risk for skin breakdown. So we have to do some intervention. That's what after once you have evaluated, you have done the assessment, you need to start checking for the patient why their babies, the, now the babies are really risk for high, high risk for skin breakdown. So if we use any ET tubes or OG tube or any medical device, we have to really use appropriate resources to prevent the skin breakdown. And this baby is a well baby. You can just look at this baby. This is 37 weeks of gestation and active and alert on demand feeding. So if you look at the score, the gestational age is more than 33. So it, we can see unless in between 33 to 38, so score three. Mental status four, mobility four, activity four, and even the nutrition excellent because demand, demand feeding moisture is four, excellent. So you can see here 23, it's just under low risk. So neonatal skin risk assessment was piloted with 32 neonates in 2013. Okay, so here, as we can see, um, this uh, there are three scales which was piloted for the to you know to evaluate which one is best. But they mentioned this preferable is neonatal skin risk assessment scale because it is useful in predicting days more likely for skin breakdown. So the study, the sensitivity and specific, you can see here. So once they have done the pilot, then they started to implement um, uh, after the piloting to July 2013 till 2014, the skin, they started to make the interventions. They formulated a skin team, literature was reviewed, and they started implementing the neonatal skin risk assessment to, to, to do the assessment and to start teaching for the nurses um, and more, create more awareness 
uh, regarding the skin assessment scale and also regarding the skin care guidelines. Then after that, in February 14, they started to uh, implement and they started to collect the data. As you can see, injury separated into, into those associated with decreased movement and those associated with medical devices. So the outcome is mentioned here. So it's gradually decreased the pressure injury. So in 2016, it's almost reduced. So uh, assessment plays a vital role to identify who are the babies who are risk for skin injury. So based on the assessment, we have to go for the intervention to go for the um, um, to go for the intervention based on the skin care guidelines. So I just want to go to the last slide of me because it was already covered and we will be doing the practical sessions regarding the uh, medical device re related injury. Uh, medical device related injury, we need to really pressure injury, we need to take more caution, especially with the sick babies because we know the reasons why they are developing the skin injury. Uh, just I want to mention some of the improvement implementation phase okay the interventions after the assessment I know it is one of the big challenge in the NICU, especially a part of nursing, because uh, the assessment is done by the nurses, the monitoring is done by the nurses, the interventions are initiated by the nurses, and we are there to prevent the uh, pressure injury. So if there is any pressure injury, stage one, stage two, unstageable, the everyone, multidisciplinary team, they will come and look at us. So the first part, the first step is the assessment. So we need to have a clear tool based on the evidence base to assess the patient routinely every shift or every 12 hours. Then based on the assessment, then we need to go for the improvement that is staff education. Uh, especially we need to uh, identify the need for improvement in available resources. The skin care, um, especially the, if you want to apply the skin care guideline, we need to ha have the available resources, especially related to the plaster and all things. The resources should be available and provide effective communication among the team members. So we need to have a skin care team like how we have the other link nurses. We need to have a skin care team, formulated team. And then we need to have a co co good communication among the team. And then sit and plan. So based on the assessment, you will identify the risk patients. Then provide, uh, you have, if there is a risk, then we have to provide the resources to prevent the skin injury and uh, the product availability, which is very important. Then the third part after planning, the third part is education. So um, I'll create a resource binder with the evidence-based practice, information, and standardized care plans for a frequent education, bedside education for the nurses and develop a wound um, especially close to the products and needed specific to the population, increase the number of redistribution surfaces. Uh, it's available in the uh, products like you have, if the patients are risk for injury, we can apply the gel mattress, uh, donuts, and like this to prevent the injury. And effective communication, which is very, very important, communication between the nurses to the team. And uh, in, the team should include the nutritionist because it is one of the vital role and neonatologist in the communication of the identified high-risk infant for skin integrity in their plan of care. So leadership support is very important, collaboration with the leaders um, for the skin injuries to meet the agenda. So um, these are the things which was based on the evidence based and they have proven that the medical device related in pressure injury were prevented in the NICUs. So these are the steps were taken. First one assessment, then planning, education for the nurses. In the planning we have included the skin, um, skin care team and education and provide all the available resources at the end, the leadership support with, the, with, this, with this one. And we, if we start implementing, uh, the skin care guidelines, then we can really prevent the pressure injury. And as for, from the presentation of Ms. Salma and Ms. Kulu, they were mentioning that in their hospital they have zero percentage of infiltration and zero percentage of pressure injury. So it can be really prevented if we apply the skin care guidelines and do the assessment um, properly. 
So I, I hope everyone will agree with that. In all NICU, good skin integrity reflect good skin, good nursing care. Agree or no? Yes. Okay. So uh, we need to be proactive uh, to find out to screen the patients, and during assessment, we have to really do the assessment properly and intervene early so that we can provide good quality and we can prevent the skin breakdown. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. You can go with the, the pressure. Can we do it quickly? Yeah, yes. this will not take much. This is the one. Uh, uh, okay, so we're gonna show you guys uh, pictures of different types of uh, skin injuries, and we're going. It's a it's an um, interactive workshop now, so we're gonna have you guys tell us what stage it is, and what stage do you think it is. Okay, dog. I'm sorry. Mm, how can I go? This one. Mm. Okay. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> so, oh. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, like uh, what Ms. Khulut, she said, would like to identify what kind of skin injury or what kind of staging of pressure injury. This is a site of Pulse Oximeter Pro, uh, leaving a redness on the skin. It was only a redness, and it is uh, blanchable. Stage one, yes. Remember, mm. blanchable. Blanchable. Mm. Khulut did mention yes. during the staging, stage one, non-blanchable. This is a main characteristic for to identify stage one, whether blanchable or non-blanchable. If it was a blanchable, it's only erythema. If it's non-blanchable, yani you press and still the redness is there, this is a stage one. Okay, so this one is was an erythema. How about this one? This is a skin injury after ET tube retaping. Um, what kind of an injury this one? This is not a pressure injury. It's not a pressure injury. Uh, what kind of? Yes, Marcy. Yes, medical Marcy. adhesive uh, related uh, uh, injury. And this is epidermal stripping, Marcy. How about this one? This skin is skin temperature placed for an extended period of time. Marcy. Marcy. Okay. So erythema. Erythema, but it is induced by. Uh, 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 there is no skin sloughness here, uh, but uh, no, it's it started cause redness. Yeah. So there's erythema, but again, it is part of a medical device. Yes. So yes, you are correct. Okay. So an injury from an IV therapy. This is not a staging. It's not induced by medical device related pressure injury. It's caused by an IV infiltration. So yes, actually so it's this an is extra, an extravasation. Extravasation. So this is different kinds of skin injuries. Okay. Yep. And let me ask, tell you something. Um, uh, for pressure injuries induced due to immobility, usually the most frequent places is the uh, Ear lobes or the occipital, uh, uh, occipital area, yes, yes, in the head. Uh, nasal injury induced by NC, uh, nasal, uh, nasal CPAP. What, do you, what kind of staging? Ms. Khulut, she did mention that. Huh? Yes? Mucosal. mucosal. Excellent. This Very is good. a mucosal, yes. Because mucosal pressure, pressure injury. injury. Good job. OK. OK, for, uh, click. Mm. OK, this is the first one. It's a non-blanchable. Erythema around the nose caused by CPAP mask. So what kind so of pressure injury? So this is over injury? here around the CPAP mask, around the nose. Non-blanchable. Yes. So stage one, it yes, non-blanchable. Stage one. This is the first injury. <laughs> Click. Okay. Stage one. What about the second injury? This is a partial thickness loss with exposed dermis due to CPAP prongs. Stage. Huh? There's partial. a partial, partial thickness loss with exposed HD. dermis. Yes. Stage two, yes. Excellent. Okay. Oof. So this is a full thickness tissue loss, uh, deep of injury obs obscured by sloth or a scar. It should be? Huh? 
What? Can you stage it? Can you see underneath? Unstageable, yes. This is an unstageable pressure injury it's because unstable. we cannot actually see until what layer it has reached. There should be some debridement done so that they will see, assess this, uh, the wound. Yes, deep tissue injury. This is a deep tissue injury, exactly. Good job. Okay, so full thickness tissue loss, depth of injury obscured scarf. by a sloth or a scarf. Unstageable, Unstageable, yes. yes. Very good. How about this one? It's an intact skin with non-blanchable erythema. Stage, Stage one. one. So remember, yes. blanchable or non-blanchable. Yes. Yes. IV infiltration. Extravasation, yes. Extravasation. Type reaction from medical adhesives. Medical adhesives. So what kind of skin injury? Marcy, yes. Marcy, yes, for medical devices. Uh, so this is a contact dermatitis. The irritant uh, contact dermatitis, yep. Okay. Skin injury after removal of adhesive. Marcy. Marcy again. So this is called epidermal stripping. Mm -hmm. Injuries from the removal of medical adhesives again. again. Yes. So you can see how much medical devices can, if neglected, can cause so much injury for different the kind of different kinds of injuries. So always be aware, changing location, doing a frequent assessment. Okay, so redness from an ID band, even ID bands. Uh, this one is uh, non-blanchable. Stage, Stage one. one. Okay. If it erythema. Was a, okay, so this mm. one, if it was a blanchable, then erythema. Mm. Okay. Yes. Full thickness tissue loss, depth of injury observed with a slot or a scar. Unstageable. Though it's a so, small sore. Mm. How about this one? Intact or in intact skin with uh, uh, evidence of underlining tissue damage, such as non blanchable deep red, purple, or maroon discoloration, may be blood or filled blister. Huh? Deep tissue. Deep tissue, yes, you guys remembered. Great Excellent. Job. Okay, injury after removal of adhesive. Epidermal yes. stripping, yes. yes. Excellent. Uh, reaction from skin disinfectant using a uh, chlorhexidine with alcohol. No, it's not Marcy. It's no. reaction from chemical, chemical burns, yes, chemical yes. burns, yes. Okay, reaction from skin disinfectant using uh, chlorhexidine with alcohol. Chemical burns, yes. But this is contact dermatitis yes. it causes. It's not reaching to burn, it's just uh, still irritating. Irritation. Yes. So the, you see the different kinds of skin injuries. Hmm. Okay. So redness from an IV tubing. It's a blanchable. Sorry? Erythema. Yes, erythema. Yes. Okay. Great job. Thank, Thank you, you so all. Much. I hope you enjoyed the, our practical session. Yes. One to one, one to two. Depends on the acuity of the patient. Mm -hmm. Level five, one to one. Yeah, according to the latest updates of the acuity, we have from level one, acuity one, up to acuity five. Once to one. Yes. Yeah, with the lower acuity, one to two. Yes, maximum, maximum is two. To, to provide the, the better nursing <laughs> interventions. That's why we have zero. Uh, it's not allowed. It's zero tolerance for any skin injury. Mm. Even the diaper dermatitis, it's being closely observed. I mean, you're only handling one patient or two patients, so come on, so you're going to cause sorry, injury. Yeah. So what are you so doing no all excuse. of this? Shit? Yes. So they have a high responsibility, yes. the nurses. Do you have incidents of chemical burn in your hospital? Yes, yes. yes. yes it can happen to any patient. It yes, it can happen. For us, I'm working at the King Faisal Hospital, the 2% chlorhexidine with the 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol. We gave the recommendation that immediately the nurse should remove any residual product. If it's left, it will cause a burn, and it happened. So regardless of the percentage? Regardless of the percentage. That's a, the updated recommendations, yes. Two percent chlorhexidine with the isopropyl alcohol. Yes. But there is new update for the evidence base. Now recently published, it says zero point two percent. Yes. 
and 0 point even one percentage that it can use for green nutrients. Yeah, it's like the last update. Last update. It's uh, one person. Yeah. Uh, it is using for the, the baby more than uh, 14 days and 0.5 uh, for science person. Yeah. We use the two percent. Yeah, it's no reason. Of we have zero clapsy, by the way. Zero clapsy. We maintain it for twenty-five months. Zero clapsy. Zero IV bloodstream infection for six years. It will not cause a chemical burn if you remove the residual product. Yeah, this is what we are having, sure but we don't have any. It doesn't matter what the percentage exactly. is, as long as you make sure you do your precaution after yeah. that. I'm telling you, it directly affects the clapsy. We have zero clapsy, and all our babies they're having seven Because lines. we just don't think about the percentage. We want it to actually be effective. We have a close uh, system of central line. No, we don't have the close system. But we maintain strict aseptic technique. We have a, a, a PR project for that where we maintain strict aseptic technique. It's the two nurses who are doing uh, the uh, changing of the, the fluids. Yes, yes, two nurses yes. Two with a strict nurses. aseptic technique, yes. Because you cannot handle it by yourself. You cannot handle it by yourself. That's why we were able to maintain 25 months of zero clapsy. And our central lines, they're staying up to 70 days, 80 days, zero bloodstream infection, I'm telling you. Yes. It's a, yeah, yeah, but you, uh, you know, it used to be a challenge. Exactly. It used to be a challenge. You can really, it can be helpful. But with proper education to the staff, and let the staff buy in, you know, have them the accountability for every infection, and this is how we get the results, and we are celebrating our success results. Accountability, I mean, meaning to say, whenever there is a blood, a blood culture being taken, the nurse, she's having the fear, oh, am I maybe getting an infection? Yes. Is it a clapsy? Because they feel the responsibility. You know why our nurses are involved to do root cause analysis if they have a positive culture? And they have to present it. Yes, because we, it's being held we accountability. If you don't. <laughs> it's being held an accountability for the nurse that you get a clapsy. Clapsy, meaning to say, uh, uh, regardless of the secondary source, you remove the secondary source, it's due to practice. So meaning to say due to the practice, who's at the bedside? Who's handling the line? It's the nurse. So anyone 48 hours prior to the onset of infection, the nurses who are dealing with the hands-on on the patient are involved to do the root cause analysis and to present it. And we've done lots of reviews, awareness, and we, we've shared our success stories even with PI projects. So the nurses were very involved. Within 48 hours, so the yes. 